Thank you for that uh, introduction. I got to say that video is a little long, so I think we'll make it a, a little shorter next time. But thank you, Tom, and I will, I will keep my promise. Uh, the last time I spoke here in this room a couple weeks ago, we did talk about ESG. Uh, and so I have good news for everyone in this room except for maybe Derek Kreifels, which is that I'm not going to actually talk about ESG too much uh, today in my remarks. I'm going I'm to pick a, bigger, a, a deeper topic that ESG is a symptom of. And I think that relates to a national identity crisis, which I'll get to in a second. But you know, we'll keep things a little light to open it up. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a, a funny joke, okay? So there's a, there's a Chinese spy balloon. We shoot it down the, earlier today. And guess who pops out other than Chairman Mao Zedong? He's come back to Earth, and he escapes from Alaska. He makes it down the Chinese countryside, and he sees a farmer on the countryside. And he says, okay, comrade. What happened to those food shortages that we used to have back when I was chairman? And so the farmer says, Chairman Mao, we no longer have food shortages in this country. Actually, we have the opposite problem. Our people have too much food. We're dying of diabetes and obesity. To which Chairman Mao says, very good, very good. But what about that 50-year plan we had to defeat the United Kingdom in steel production? Did we achieve that goal? To which the farmer says, well, Chairman Mao, the Hongzhou province alone produces more steel than all of Western Europe. To which Chairman Mao says, very good. But the last question he asks is, comrade, but tell me, whatever happened to that cultural revolution that I started with those young kids in China? Whatever happened to that? And the farmer laughs and he says, Chairman Mao, we don't do that here anymore. We've exported that to the United States. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about three different secular religions that have curiously popped up at the same time in this country. Okay? The, the first of them is a secular religion that says your identity is based on your skin color. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. No matter your economic upbringing, by the way, no matter how much money you have, no matter what kind of household you grew up in, your race governs who you are and what you're allowed to achieve in life. And a clear statement of this philosophy, the clearest statement I've heard, actually, of what's at the heart of it came from Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. I came from D.C. earlier today, a member of the squad, who famously said that we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice that we don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. Now, I do not fit her description of what counts as a brown voice, but there's a, there's a really interesting move embedded in that little religion. And it's this. It's that when your race goes from being about your skin color to being about the content of the ideas you're allowed to espouse, then any disagreement with those ideas automatically makes you a racist, and there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. And it is a form of damnation because this is a religion. And that's what's created this new culture of fear in our country, by the way, the fear of losing your job, fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school, fear of becoming a pariah in your own community. And that culture of fear is what's replaced our culture of free speech in America, which I'll get back to in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody still believes it. <laughs> I like that. So, so then there's a curiosity, because right around the same time as this racial religions emerged on American soil, we have a second religion. It is the gender ideology religion. It emerges right around the same time, okay? The curious feature of this religion, this one comes in many alphabets, LBGTQIA+. Okay, there's just a plus for all the other letters of the alphabet soon to come. The, the interesting thing about this religion is that it was the same movement that told us 30 years ago that the sex of the person you're attracted to is hardwired at birth, because it had to be. If it weren't that, it couldn't be protected by civil rights statutes. You know, let's just say sexual orientation could not be a protected class from a legal perspective. If it wasn't hardwired at birth, it's like Lady Gaga would say, I was born this way. I don't know if that applies to the stream of vomit coming on a young girl. I don't know if you guys have seen a little bit of an older crowd here. Maybe didn't see that video <laughs> traveling on, on, on social media in the last couple of days. But, but anyway, that, that, was, that was the whole premise of this religion because the entire civil rights argument depended on the idea that you were the sex you're attracted to 
is hardwired on the day you're born. It's not something you choose. Yet it's the same movement that, with a religious zealotry, applies the, espouses the exact opposite contention when it comes to not the sex of the person you're attracted to, but actually your own biological sex, which is completely fluid over the course of your lifetime. It's a bit of a paradox, and also embedded in this is a move just like the one Congresswoman Ayanna Presley made, where they said an interesting thing about Peter Thiel, who is gay. They said about him after he spoke at the 2016 Republican convention, the advocate, one of the leading gay rights magazines in the United States, said that actually Peter Thiel is not gay because he does not represent the gay voice. So you're seeing a pattern here. Then there's the third religion. This one's my favorite one of all, okay? And it's the one that's gonna be here to stay for a while to come. That is the new climate religion. Okay, and as I said on Tucker Carlson's show, which is airing approximately right now, we, we pre-taped it today, but the, the, as I said earlier today, the climate religion has about as much to do with the climate as the Spanish Inquisition had to do with Christ, which is to say nothing at all. <laughs> It is a means for punishment and control. And I, I can prove that to you, actually, because if the climate religion were really about climate change, then the thing we would care about was stopping it at all costs. And yet, why does it have a maniacal obsession with stopping gas production and oil production here in the United States while shifting that production to places like China, because last time I thought the thing we're addressing, last time I checked, was supposed to be global warming. And yet not only is it just net neutral, it's like the same thing with the virtue signaling wrapper. It actually turns out, if you really want to get into the tenets of this religion, methane leakage in China is actually much worse than it is in the United States. And even if you subscribe to the Ten Commandments of this religion, methane is 80 times worse for supposed global warming than is carbon dioxide. So, so you would think that that was a concern of the climate religion, but it's not. You would think that the, tenet, that the, the people who espouse this religion would then be embracing, let's say, something like nuclear energy, which is the best known form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. And yet, that very movement, including the ESG apostles who push this religion, reject nuclear energy by fiat. Vanguard's ESG funds, at least as of last year, I think it's still true today, systematically exclude nuclear energy by rule. What's going on there? Might it be the fact that nuclear energy might be too good at actually solving the alleged climate problem, which means it stops being a Trojan horse for advancing the real agenda? an agenda of global equity, making the West, particularly America, apologize for its once colonialist sins. Because we would have never accepted that agenda if we said that's what it was actually all about. That it was about apologism, it was about wearing hair shirts, about flogging ourselves. Then we wouldn't have accepted it. But if you say it's about this new religion, this new God that we call not Christ but climate, then somehow there's something inside us that makes us want to bend our knee to this new master. And so that actually brings me to the topic I'm going to talk about. And this is, this is a little more serious, okay. It is the fact that as a nation today, I believe we are in the middle of a national identity crisis. I speak as a member of my generation here. I'm 37 years old. I'm a millennial. I was born in 1985. My generation, and I think every generation today, is so hungry for a cause, hungry for purpose and meaning and identity at a point in our national history when the things that used to fill that void, things like faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. That leaves a deep moral and cultural vacuum in its wake. That is what allows the woke movement to prey on that vacuum. That is why you see the rise of one secular religion after another, from wokeism to climatism to covidism to transgenderism. It's not a coincidence. It is a symptom of the actual cancer, a black hole of identity. The fact that we hunger to be part of something bigger than ourselves, even as we cannot even answer the question of, say, what it means to be an American in the year 2023. 
When I see it, we're like bats. We're like blind bats flying around in a cave, sending out our sonar signals. Here's what human beings are. Actually, go to a lot of the ancient Greek philosophers. They describe it in almost so many, so many words. You send a signal. It bounces off something. You get your identity back. Okay? Bounce off a pillar of family. That's one source of identity. You send your signal. Bounces back. Okay, I deduce my identity from the family of which I am a part. From God or the religion in which I believe. Great. Send the signal. Deduce my family identity, my faith-based identity, my national identity, my identity as a citizen of a nation. So when these things disappear, faith, family, country, national identity, all you're left with is that void, that black hole of an abyss. And our generation, my generation in particular, is lost in that black hole. That is what allows poison to fill the void. I think this is a challenge. I think it's the defining challenge of our time in our country. But I also think it is an opportunity. I think it is an opportunity for the conservative movement in this country to fill that vacuum, to fill that void. Thank you. We have spent four plus years, eight years, I don't know how long, spotting the problem. And that was important. There's an important stage, first stage of addressing a cancer is diagnosing it. Okay, and that I believe we have not completely done, but we have mostly done. Okay, we see the problem. The problem is that void. The next question is, can we fill that void with something more meaningful than what the other side is putting on offer? Okay. Our inner animal spirit at the heart of the American soul, it has been domesticated. It has been tamed by this new culture that rejects truth and embraces relativism, that rejects God and embraces secularism, that rejects equal opportunity and embraces equal results, that rejects excellence and embraces victimhood. Okay, that inner animal, it has leapt oceans to lift up places like China while their culture of Maoist victimhood came back all the way over here to hold us down. And if you ask me, when we rallied behind the cry to make America great again, we didn't just hunger for any single man. We hungered for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in this country because that is what it means to be American. This is personal to me, actually. My parents came here in the late 70s, early 80s, moved to southwest Ohio, where I grew up. I was a skinny kid with nerdy glasses, a funny last name with a dad who had a funny accent in a part of the country where that didn't let, allow you to fit in back in the 90s. My parents taught me something funny. They said, you know what? If you're going to stand out, you might as well be outstanding. I thank them for that. Achievement was my ticket to get ahead. Okay, this is personal to me. Merit means something in America. And when we think about reviving that national identity, there's a lot of ways to say it. But the way I say it is that we can revive a national identity that puts the merit back into America and every sphere of American life. I think we hunger for it. I say this as a first-generation American. Merit, starting with merit, who gets into this country, okay? We have an immigration policy in this country that is accidental rather than intentional. My parents came to this country through the front door. They followed the rules. They paid their taxes. They raised a family with two kids. Both of us actually went on to found companies that employed and helped thousands of Americans. They taught us that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood and that there is more to life than following your last indulgence, that creating a family involves, yes, making a sacrifice. Yes, marriage involves a sacrifice. Yes, raising kids involves a sacrifice. But certain sacrifices are worth making. That's what our parents taught us. We should want more immigrants like them, but not, thank you. But I say this as a kid of immigrants, but not immigrants 
whose first act of entering this country is a law-breaking one because part of our identity is that we are a nation built on the rule of laws, a nation of laws, and you are not welcome to be part of a country if your act of entering it breaks the law in the first place. That's meritocracy in immigration. Thank you. It's not just merit in who gets into this country. It's merit in who gets ahead in this country. I think our conservative movement <laughs> actually needs to be not just the party of Lincoln, but dare I say, the party of Martin Luther King's message, reviving our conviction in the idea that you get ahead in America not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. Thank you. This is doable. We get rid of Amer affirmative action in every sphere of our life. This has been a cancer on our national soul. And mark my words, when the Supreme Court overturns affirmative action in college admissions later this year, we take that movement to every other sphere of American life. And you know what? Affirmative action, <laughs> like most bad things, it actually started. Not a lot of people know this. It actually started with the federal government. It was a Johnson-era executive order. You look it up, 11246 is what it's called. It's designed to be boring sounding. What it says is, if you do business with the federal government, if you're a government contractor, that sounds like a small sector of the US economy, right? You'd be wrong. Google to Boeing to General Motors, over 20% of the US workforce is covered by companies that are government contractors as defined by this executive order, have to adopt race-based quota systems as a condition for doing business with the U.S. government. You want a trickle-down effect? That is a cultural trickle-down. It has been a cancer on our national soul. But the good news is this is low-hanging fruit. Okay, if we have conservative leaders in this country, and you know, back in Reagan's era, Bush, even Trump, the political calculus have taken a pen and crossing that out. They said that's not a political risk we want to take. If we're really the party of Martin Luther King's message, the movement of Martin Luther King's vision for being judged on the color of your, not on the color of your skin, but the content of your character, that needs to be the first thing we're able to do so that we get rid of it in every other sphere of our lives, getting rid of this de facto racism in American life and reviving excellence in its place. Thank you. Thank you. I came here, as I said, from Washington, D.C. I think we need to restore excellence and merit in who governs in America. And there's a really simple way to do it, okay? It's not that complicated. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer it to you. It's my version of, of a dream as a citizen, okay? I have a dream that the people we elect to run the government are the people who actually run the government. That ain't the case today, okay? So the next time an Anthony Fauci or a Merrick Garland or a James Comey tries to run a government, exercise political power that nobody elected them to exercise, then what you need is governors and all the way up to a president in this country who's willing to do the thing that a constitutionally empowered chief executive is supposed to do in this country. You fire them. You fire the legions of people under them. You dismantle the managerial industrial complex around them. <laughs> Thank you. I can think of nothing more anti-meritocratic than the existence of civil service protections for employees of a federal government, or by the way, most state governments for that matter too. Okay, I've run companies. I'll, I'm going to give you a simple rule of thumb. If somebody works for you and you cannot fire them, that means that they do not work for you it means you work for them. It means you are their slave. Because <laughs> they can do something and you're responsible for it. You, you can't even change what they did. Well, that's the situation in the federal government today, friends. That's exactly the way this game works. And so what I say is we can do something really simple. Take those civil service protections and you replace it with a simple sunset clause instead that says that, you know what, if you can't be the president of the United States and collect a salary from the federal government for more than eight years then I don't think most federal bureaucrats should be collecting a salary from the federal government for more than eight years either. It's pretty simple, actually. It's gotten so bad that the right answer is you got to take some of these agencies 
and actually start doing the thing we should have been doing a long time ago. You shut them down. If you ask me, you start with the FBI, and he can go straight down the list from there. And when you really need to, you replace one with something new. Okay. That's merit in government. Now, merit in government can only thrive in a democracy if we also have a meritocracy of ideas in this country. I'm going to say something real simple again. The best ideas win when no ideas are censored. Now, free speech is a precondition for truth in this country. But I'll tell you something else. In the moment we live in today, free speech is a precondition for peace in this country. If you tell people they cannot speak, that is when they scream. If you tell people they cannot scream, that is when they start tearing things down. We're at a moment where, I, 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 I'm going to get to the good part, you know, this can still be saved, but once we, once we get to the tearing it down part, that's the beginning of the end as we know it. And it's not, it's not just a big tech problem, actually. I don't call it big tech censorship anymore. I encourage all of you to join me in calling it what it actually is. It is government tech censorship. Where today what the U.S. government is doing is they're using private companies to do through the back door what government could not get done through the front door under the Constitution. So, so I'm going to say something that the inner libertarian in me would have never said 10 years ago, but if you see what's happening today, this is actually the reality where if it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies. These companies ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States when they are doing the government's dirty work in coordination with the government itself. Thank you. Now, it's not just the Internet. I think we make that mistake sometimes. The free speech issue, the censorship issue, it is not limited to the Internet. It pervades the American economy. It pervades the American workforce. The number of people who have been fired for saying the wrong thing, posting the wrong thing on social media, wearing the hat of the wrong presidential candidate to work, saying the wrong thing on their own time, forget at work, even attending the wrong political rally. This is un-American. This is not the way this country works. And my view is, you want to take Martin Luther King's message, you want to take that civil rights revolution and bring it into the 21st century, you know what I say? If you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody for their race, sex, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, and so on, then you should not be able to fire somebody or deplatform somebody for their political speech either. We need to make political expression a civil right in this country. Now, now the Reaganites, the Freedmanites, even me, 10 years ago, would say, that, no, 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 the free market should work this out. Okay, we should not impose one more constraint on what a business can and cannot do. The market should fix this. And so if these businesses are firing those, conserv those great conservatives, then this business over here can hire them instead, and we just got to leave it to the market. You know, Sununu will say something like this today, okay? We have still vestiges of people who recite slogans that they memorized back in 1980. But, you know, and, and that, that worked in 1980, and I think there's logic to it, and I think it's worth calling it out. I was sympathetic to this logic myself. But you can't have it both ways, okay? So either we do the free market thing, okay? And we do the free market thing and we say that we're going to get rid of protected classes altogether and we actually let the market work, or else you apply the standards even-handedly to say that if you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or Hindu or whatever, that you should not be able to deplatform somebody or fire somebody just because they're an outspoken conservative. We're not a country that makes you choose between speaking your mind freely and putting food on the dinner table, between the American dream and the First Amendment. We're the quintessential nation on earth where you get to enjoy both of those things at the same time. That, too, is part of what it means to be American. Thank you. Thank you. So, so here's, here's my view. If we do these things, okay, restore merit in who gets into this country, 
Restore merit in who gets ahead into this country. Restore merit in who governs this country. Merit in the ideas that win in this country. That's reviving what I call a shared national identity. Then, and only then, can we take on the actual existential challenge that we face on the global stage over the next decade. And I began with it jokingly, but I mean it in all seriousness. This is the rise of communist China. Okay. The declaration of independence we need in this century is a declaration of independence from China. We are in a codependent relationship. Codependent relationships do not end well. This one will not last. The only question is who ends it first. The sooner we end it, the better for us. The later we end it, the better for them. And I think we have an opportunity to rise to the occasion now. We have a window we're working with where they've actually inflicted a lot of damage on themselves to let their guy Xi Jinping take this third term. This is our window now to defeat China economically so we will never have to militarily. Thank you. <laughs> Semiconductor self-sufficiency. Okay, the, the chips that power your phones in your pocket, the laptops that you use, the refrigerators that kept your drinks cold before they brought them out. Okay, it is a shame. I have no idea how we ever got to a place where our entire modern way of life actually depends on one tiny island nation off the southeast coast of China in the South China Sea. Thank you, Henry Kissinger, but we are where we are. We got to actually figure out where we go from here. Semiconductor self-sufficiency, energy leadership in this country, I think that's going to involve saying something that's going to make a lot of people mad in this country, but it involves abandoning, and I really mean it all the way down, abandoning a global climate religion that shackles the United States while leaving China untouched. We're done. This is not going to be easy. Some of this is going to involve sacrifice, okay? Because what China realized was that we played this game. Thank you, Henry Kissinger. Thank you, the bipartisan consensus of democratic capitalism for most of the 1990s, okay? We played this game that said that we thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us. They were going to export Big Macs and Happy Meals, and somehow that's going to spread democracy to places like China. What well, they realized is they could turn that game on its head, and they realized they could use access to their market, their money, to get us to be more like them, or even one step better, they can use our money to get us to be more like them and send back Disney movies and Apple iPhones as Trojan horses, TikTok for that matter, to undermine us from within. What is this going to, what does this mean? What does it mean we have to do about it? It's going to be a lot of, a lot of people in the Republican establishment who aren't going to like what I'm going to say. But I, I think that it's going to involve some short-term pain for long-run gain. I think it is perfectly reasonable to say that most American businesses should not be able to do business in China until communist China has reformed its behaviors, behaving not as a mercantilist nation, using companies as pawns to achieve its geopolitical agenda, but actually is playing in the rules of free market capitalism that we thought we were engaging in with them. That's not going to be easy. That's going to be tough. It's going to involve serious sacrifice in the short run. But that's what it's going to require if we're going to address the otherwise long-run existential challenge we face. Or it's as Mao Zedong said. Maybe he'll say it again to the farmer when he showed up. Sell them the rope on Friday that we will use to hang them on Sunday. That's exactly been the Chinese game for 50 years. Now we're seeing it play out. Think about the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we deliver accountability to China for originating the most devastating pandemic by death toll in over a century. We're going to have to use every financial lever in our arsenal to do it. It's not polite to say this, but that can include, but not be limited to, even using the national debt that they hold as a lever to do it. Because if we don't, it's just going to be worse the next time around. What does this say? Okay, you send one spy balloon, you wait till it gets over South Carolina to shoot it down, watch travel over a whole country. Is it any mystery? There was a second one that was over Alaska today. It's not a mystery. What do you think is going to happen if you originate the greatest global pandemic that then holds the United States back and the Western world back if you don't actually hold them accountable? What else can you expect? The problem is we are addicted to this nation. We are addicted to China. Okay? 
digital fentanyl in the form of TikTok, financial fentanyl in the form of debt, and actual fentanyl in the form of what's actually crossing our border from China across the southern border of Mexico. We're going to deal with it with actually taking on sacrifices. Okay, telling our kids that we're actually going to lead them instead of actually buckle to their every demand and say, you know what? If you can't smoke an addictive cigarette in this country by the age of 18, then I don't think you should be using and it allowed to use an addictive social media product like TikTok under the age of 16. It's actually pretty simple. Financial fentanyl, well, you know what? We've gotten addicted to somebody being able to buy up our debt, not realizing that that's actually a lever over the long run. Skiing on artificial snow for the last 15 years, money raining from on high like mana from heaven, instead recognizing that actually self-restraint in our own spending isn't just a matter of economic self-sufficiency. It is now a matter of national security and external dependence as well. And we're talking about the different addictions. It's not just the digital fentanyl. It's not just the financial fentanyl. It's the actual fentanyl. This is a question I often get. How do you deal with that problem today? I think Trump had it right back in 2015 when he said build the wall. Problem is today, those cartels are actually on our side of the border. Go up California, Oregon, the demand pushing off from one side to the other in terms of who gets on one side of the border, unfortunately, because we didn't do it, that's not going to be sufficient now. I think we need to do some things that are going to make our defense industrial complex a little upset by actually using them to protect the American interest by saying that, you know what, we might be done spending protecting somebody else's border, but when you want to talk about a war on drugs, I'm talking about actually going to war on the cartels, going Muhammad Atta, Osama bin Laden, Soleimani on the people running the cartels. Because if the U.S. Isn't gonna, military isn't going to be used to protect our border, I don't know what purpose we have it for otherwise as well. These are not going to be easy sacrifices to make. But here's what I will say. We can make these sacrifices if we know what we are sacrificing for. We have celebrated over the last decade our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we're really just the same as one people. The basic rules of the road. You think about the things that I just said in the last half hour, okay? Basic stuff, meritocracy, free speech, integrity of electing people who actually run the government, taking on China. I know I'm speaking to a conservative audience here. I'm a conservative, and I'm glad you all like what I have to say. But honest to God, you take those ideas, and you just ask most people in this country, I don't care, Democrat, Republican, Independent, doesn't matter, just look in the mirror. Ask yourself, do you believe in these basic rules of the road? I think what you will find is that most people do, actually. We might disagree on, <laughs> you know, corporate tax rates, whether ivermectin treats COVID, okay? Those are details. But do you agree on the basic principles, the basic rules of the road? I just think most of us do. I think most of us think our neighbors do, that our teammates do, that our colleagues do, that our classmates do, even in the next generation of Americans. But, but we can't be sure anymore because we're not allowed to talk about it. But once we break down that conversational silo, I don't care if you're black or white, gay or straight, Democrat or Republican, I think we're committed to those basic rules of the road, the ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago, the ideals that brought together a divided polyglot group of people back in 1776 can be the ideals that bring together a divided polyglot group of people today. E pluribus unum, from many, one. That is the vision that won the American Revolution. That is the vision that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the vision that won us two world wars and the Cold War. And if you ask me, that is still the dream that gives hope to the free world as we know it today. And if we can revive those common ideals over this fractious group identity and grievance, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about, and that is what we're going to need to revive in order to save this great nation. Thank you. Bob, let's have at it.